Welcome to another edition of Piano Book. Oh, I've really caused myself an injury on this once. So, I recorded a rusty gate. Why did I do this? Well, for me, it was full of resonance and interesting artefacts. And after 11 years of making samples professionally, I've developed a bit of a sixth sense for these things. I thought this would make a good sample. Turns out those 11 years don't count for much because it sounds terrible, because it sounds like a rusty gate. So what did I do? But I've had an idea. I turned it into a competition, which now means I have over 400 rusty gate samples to judge in order to make you a shortlist. Competition now closed, close it on Saturday as promised. And thank you so much for your enthusiastic response. Not only do I have to listen to your rusty gate samples, I've also got to watch you making and listening to you make the rusty gates. It's going to be quite a challenge before next week to get down to a shortlist. If you recall, I'm going to shortlist the top five. The top three are going to win a free copy of Ambient Guitars, but the winner is going to win a free piece of hardware. And you girls and guys voted between these bits of kit. And you know, I personally would have gone for the Strymon Big Sky. It's a really easy kind of first choice for amazing bit of outboard kit that, you know, I think there are some alternatives plug-in wise, but there's just something about this bit of luscious kit. But you didn't. You did the right thing. A random piece of vintage kit. This community understands the value, the personality to want to go out on a limb. I doff my caps to you all. Right, back to pianos, namely my Schimmel, which I sampled in this video a few weeks back. Finally got round to looking at the multi-mic masterpiece I hope for it to be. So the first thing I had to do is because we're not working with one set of signals, we're working with three, the pair of M149s, the Apollo 2, which is a stereo ribbon, and the Soyuz, which I borrowed. I'm thinking about getting one, but it is you know quite expensive. So I grouped those together. So everything that I'm editing, I'm editing simultaneously. And if you recall, what we do is we just cut to here nominally, and then we drag back, and then we input a 36,000 sample offset into EXS, and then go into EXS and tighten up each sample. Now, the difficulty with that is I know that that would then mean that I'm having to physically type in the different offset values for the additional mics in various different instances of EXS. EXS does have some certain limitations, and I tried building it as a multi-mic with each mic in separate groups, single instrument, and it got very confused. But also the limitations on voice counts, this, that, and the other, meant that I had to program it into separate EXSs, one for each microphone. So what I thought I'd do is for each note, I'd simply go in and be a little bit more accurate with my editing at this stage. But it's still not hard editing. There we go, that's where I think the beginning is. Uh, because what I then do and it's quite interesting. So you'll see that it's quite kind of way before the on point there, because I'm a keyboard player, so I play everything ahead of the beat. I'm going to use the one that's cut on the beat as the reference and then drag it back as before, so like that. Smack locked on there, and you'll notice if we go in there, that will also be ahead as that one was. I don't know if that's an obvious thing. It wasn't to me. But what's great about that is then I can go into EXS and just offset it at 36,000 samples. Basically, all of these, you know, fine tuning that I've done should be in place. Now, Something that really I think is very interesting about piano sampling and sampling in general is the war we have between reality and playability. And I think it's kind of writ large with piano samples. And you know, I made that joke about keyboard players playing ahead of the beat, and that is because pianos don't play on the beat. So if you've learned on the piano, you have a natural sense to actually play slightly ahead in order to be on the one, because so much happens before the actual notes. And then when we transition between pianos and synthesizers, that's when your bassist and your drummer go, mate, you're well ahead of the beat, because we're used to playing ahead. Tuba players on their low notes have to really genuinely play maybe a sixteenth ahead of the rest of the band in order for the note to sound. The problem is, the stuff that goes on before the note sound is what gives an instrument its characteristic. And I've got a great example of that here, a couple of interesting observations I've made whilst editing these together. So if you want this to sound tight, you can see that that's the point where a more kind of continuous waveform occurs. That is the point at which the actual note 
starts playing. So it forms this slightly more constant vibration that forms the note in our ears. You can see that I've played enough ahead of the beat so that the actual note forms on the beat. So that's my natural instinct. I'm quite chuffed with that actually. If I cut it to that, that is gonna make for a really tight, responsive piano sound. But let's have a listen to it. Sounds great, sounds like a piano, but if we roll forward to actually where I actually start playing the notes, have a listen to this. So tight, and then way before. And trust me, if we were to make a piano all cut from where the note is actually sounding, the net result, all of these tiny little 1% when you're sampling add up to provide something that just doesn't sound as good. It feels great and bitey. It just sounds like a bad synth or a badly sampled piano. But because we play a variety of instruments on these controllers, we really notice when suddenly you've got to kind of play ahead of the beat again. So you have to adjust your thinking. Now, one of the ways you can counteract this lack of responsiveness is to actually cut hard into the notes on your sample and then you can create a kind of responsive performance version of your sample set so whilst you're playing stuff in and then you have your more truly offset version which you can kind of patch back in for playback and you simply put an offset in and that should take care of it but for me when I'm writing I need the full sample because I, I'm not inspired by something that feels like a synth or a badly sampled piano the other thing I think was really interesting is I had to find, because all of the microphones uh, are at different positions, I had to nominate a microphone as the master microphone. And I decided that that would be the M149. And what's really interesting about it is you can already see, just by a distance of, I don't know, maybe that much, you can see the slowness of the speed of sound there. If we bring the cursor here, you can see that the Apollo is triggering later, where the Sawyer's is a little bit more kind of instantaneous. And that's where I had a bit of difficulty because the M149, when you're to the left of the keyboard, uh, was definitely, that was the thing that was, it was hitting that microphone first. And then if we go all the way to the right, you'll see that it's very much hitting that microphone, the right hand one first. So I knew that once I built this stuff, there was a likelihood that I was gonna have to go in and edit individual mics, but then adjust the sample offsets for all the mics so they remain kind of uh, cohesive. I didn't wanna phase align them. I think again, that gives a, a falseness and it reduces the, the 3D kind of quality of the sound. So let's open up the sample build. Okay, so here's all of the different sample builds, and you'll see, if I just compare some of these, it does absolutely infuriate me that it doesn't just have these as a matter of course, and that every time you open them, sorry, I'm being grumpy. By and large, everything is 3600, but it was interesting, it wasn't until I built the Sawyers that the mid-range started clipping and clicking a bit, and you'll see that we've reduced some here, and if we just align that up here, you'll see that and that match there. So I'm adjusting the offset for all of the notes. One of the wonderful things about QA, quality assurance, that we, we've learned uh, the hard way at Spitfire is that you can do a very scientific approach where you play every note, and that's a great way to find notes that are clipping, which is why we've reduced these back. But the one thing you can't do is really work out how the notes are balanced until you start writing stuff. And that's what I really like about sample development that you have to involve musicians and you have to be musical in order to really get the instrument feeling right and you'll see that I've done various volume tweaks which I've matched with all the microphones so again you're not having a kind of shift in perspective because different microphones are being turned up and down it's the same moment in time that's been recorded just recorded by different microphones so in order to balance the piano you have to balance all of the mics in kind of unity. Going back to that idea of creating a, a an offset or a responsive piano, so if you want to cut in, you know, my suggestion would be to cut in maybe 38,000 samples in. So that obviously doesn't sound great because it's all clicky. Now instead of going in there and doing all sorts of crazy hard edits, what I just do is adjust Just the ADSR. So again, you pull back a little bit of the responsiveness. So that 
uh, nice and kind of really responds and then I do a version where we go back to how we had it before so can it undo yes it can that's that's something that contact can't do it's infuriating but as I say I like to perform with the the correct offset in place and just have to reprogram now you're playing a piano you're not playing a synth right this is the M149 What I'm loving about this piano is that it has the effect of a felt piano, but it just has a, that little bit more cut through. And I've used the winter piano, which is a kind of a, a slightly more beta version of this uh, sampling experience uh, in an episode of Inside Number Nine really recently, and they absolutely loved it because it cut through, but it still had that kind of drama mellowness. Right, let's pull up the Sawyers. So this is going to be mono, and it's great, I think, you know, for, for pop and stuff to have a mono piano is absolutely fantastic. It's, you can really place it. Something just completely heartbreaking about it. And then the Apollo, which is, if you recall, it was behind my head, stereo ribbon microphone. And because it's a ribbon, it cuts all of the horrible brightness of a room like this uh, quite magically. Now, I do think for the price, it's really pretty sensational. And it's interesting, it feels really up close when you're quiet. But when you hit the, the heavier dynamic, you get more of the slightly boxy room that it's recorded in. I know that the contact programmers amongst us are having difficulty doing this. We have come up with a script in Spitfire to do it, I know, because we had to do it recently. Um, something that, that EXS does recognise is that the, the release triggers should happen when you release the notes, not the sustain pedals. which is, again, the correct way that a piano actually works. I'll talk to Spitfire about giving us the script for contact so it behaves in that manner as well. So we'll come back to how she sounds in a moment. There's just a couple of community bits to talk about. Someone very wisely pointed out that it's got to such a point now with the number of pianos that are on Piano Book that it's difficult to know which ones to download for the particular job you have in hand. Some are quite old sounding, some are out of tune, some are very pristine sounding. And you're absolutely right, without downloading all of them, and I am being hammered on S3 at the moment. Uh, it's impossible to know which are the ones that you would prefer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work through on film for these piano books, little clips for each piano, and I'll edit them into unlisted videos so that they can be mounted onto Squarespace. But also what I was hoping was that maybe you could offer up your compositional prowess to maybe create some demos for each of the pianos. It doesn't matter, there isn't a limit to the number of demos per page. Now, I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but some nice gentleman uh, set up a SoundCloud for a piano book and I've scoured my emails, but I've lost your contact details. So could you reach back out to me? Because I want to know if you're still up for posting these stuff up on SoundCloud and then we can start putting them on the piano book piano pages. We've created a new email address for these submissions called demos at pianobook.co.uk. Now, whilst we won't be able to write a lengthy thing about the, the demos, what we will be able to do is put in the title of the track uh, whatever information you want to disclose, whether that be an Instagram account or a Twitter or a website. So short name for the title, then a hyphen, then very minimal kind of contact details. And whilst we're on the subject of community matters, there is just one more thing you could possibly get involved with should you want to. So, James Bellamy, who you've met many times before, original Spitfire gangster and also originally recovering music editor. Recovering music editor. <laughs> music editor for Oscar winning films, I may hasten to, to add. James has come up to, to Edinburgh to discuss just basically a, a new set of experimental films that we're doing, which mm -hmm. are going to be very short, informative. We started kind of doing scripting them and doing shot lists, and we, we suddenly went, it's quite a lot. <laughs> a lot of shots because we do like to under complicate things at yeah, it's all all times, yeah. so we thought it would be fun to see if we could crowdsource some of these shots as opposed to just pulling them off shutter stock and I thought well what better kind of collaborative community to reach out to than piano book particularly kind of reaching out to kind of instrumentalists and again you don't have to be virtuosos or particularly good at your instruments we've created a, a, a public Google 
yep. sheet yep. which will be linked below the video uh, and if you look inside there there's uh, you can see what the video is going to be about some of the shots we're looking for are labeled as being crowdsourced they're the ones in red so if you could send in examples of yourself doing some of the things that we've uh, listed in that document that would be really helpful. If you want to take part in this experimental enterprise the shooting scripts are basically linked below along with an email to send your films to. It doesn't need to be posh it could just be iPhone footage or a GoPro or whatever you have to hand. And another thing that, that came up recently is this this idea that piano books just for pianos. It's called piano book because that's the kind of kicking off point but for me it is a community sampling project and I don't want to restrict the bandwidth to people who are fortunate enough to own pianos or have grown up with family pianos. So if you have anything that you think the community would be interested in playing, whether it be a guitar or a toy piano or a synth, please submit those also, pianobook.co.uk. So let's put these all together. So this beauty is available now to download at pianobook.co.uk, your place for free pianos, free samples, and a place to submit your work as a samplist. Thanks as always for watching. Thanks so much for your commitment to this project. If you haven't subscribed yet, well, it would be churlish not to. So many freebies coming up. Ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put up a video. And one of those always much appreciated. See you next time.